So Liz, thanks for coming along today. Delighted. And an inductee into the Scottish Traditional Music Hall of Fame, you've done so much amazing work over the years. Well, funnily enough, I've never thought of it as work. It's been, and it's not even been a vocation, it's just been a life basically and uh, to be in with the music from the start it's just been a complete joy and a, a, a wonderful journey so far. <laughs> so you originally from Rutherglen but you yep. moved up to the northeast of Scotland very young. Yeah my father was a manager for British Rail up there and it became national carriers so um, my mother didn't like the northeast so we kept finding our new houses up there so we kind of moved a bit of the 18 months when he found it a nice new house, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, I think that's why I was very akin to the travellers. <laughs> I get used to it. You know? <laughs> Did you end up right in the middle of the culture? Yeah, completely, because we moved out to a wee place called Dunmolothy, Skite, and my mother had the village shop out there. And everybody came in, it became a hub. And uh, although it was kind of shut at night, folk would come in and sit on, you know, the the sort of uh, lemonade cartons, uh, crates and things like that and we'd have a wee tune and things like that so it was quite a hub in Drummothy for a good few years you know and of course we stayed in Stonehaven as well and uh, sort of when Celtic played in Aberdeen the whole of Rutherglen came up to uh, Stonehaven and we had parties and all the Celtic team they used to stay in the Bay Hotel then it was a quite a posh hotel and they would come down so the whole of Stonehaven would rock you know with uh, sort of the Irish culture uh, for a weekend every time Celtic came up to play Aberdeen, you know, so that was another introduction to music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the language around you must have been amazing. Oh, fantastic. When uh, my brother had gone to school, so I was not alone, but I, I was on my own quite a lot, and uh, I used to donner down to the kippering sheds in Stonehaven, or the smoking sheds, and it was the women, they would sing and they would scuff their clogs that had tacks in them, and, uh, raunchous laughter they, for doing this hard work they seem to have a wonderful time and I thought oh, I want to be one of them when I grow up you know I want to be a fisherwoman you know I work in the fishing sheds uh, I don't think my mother was too pleased with that one but they sang and they sang in Doric and I learned the Doric uh, I didn't know what a lot of I didn't know all the double entendres of the songs they were singing uh, much to the Catholic Women's Institute amusement when I sang it there. <laughs> <coughs> but that's really where the, the music started, very young between the, the Irish Scottish culture and then the, the Doric of the North East and the wonderful Bothy ballads and songs that you would hear from people just coming in and sitting singing them. It's magic. And so you you met the Stuarts of Blair, where did you meet them about? Uh, well, the Thompsons that stayed in the Boyne, we stayed in the Boyne for a while, one of the places we'd stayed. I don't think we actually paid our rent, and that's why we had to move. And maybe the other story was just a good one to put around. Uh, but the Thompsons in a boy, nobody talked to them because uh, they were tinks, and nobody talked to us because we were from Glasgow. They were a bit elitist in a boy when we were there, uh, that was in the 60s. So we got to talk to each other, Kathleen and I, and we became firm friends. And she'd come to the television for an hour a day or two hours a day or something like that, so she'd come up to my house. But the Marquis of Huntley had them staying in the great big uh, gatehouse and had hired the travellers, the tanks, as his gamekeepers, which was the best thing he could ever have done, because they all knew about uh, the forest husbandry and keeping their fish well stocked, etc, etc, and not allowing poachers in uh, and things like that. So the, the, they had their culture. But they sort of lived inside, outside. There was a big hole in the roof, and they had a, a fire with spivet, and they cooked inside on the spivet, and the smoke went through the roof rather than a chimney. And my mother had never seen the house, so when she got invited down to tea, those days she got very dressed up, you know, the, uh, the Sunday best and the hat and the gloves, as women did in the 50s, and I had to go out to tea. And she came down, and when she walked in, my mother was expecting kind of fancy house because it looked magnificent from the outside. I think it sold eventually for about four million pounds when they renovated it. But she came in and found it was tree stumps with wee cushions on it round this fire. I never could twig that my mother thought anything different. She was just such a wonderful woman. She just accepted everybody the way they were. So she shook hands with everything. She sat down. She got the good mug with a string round about it. Had a brilliant conversation about Ireland uh, with old Mr. Thompson, the, the grandfather, and uh, talked about the Irish coming over for the Tack Hauk and, 
and the Irish songs going back and forward. Had a wonderful afternoon. As my mother was going back up the road, she just held my hand and she giggled all the way home. And she just went, oh, Elizabeth, you know, because I didn't know any difference. I didn't think there was any culture clashes or anything like that. I just knew there were people alike and liked me. And I always remember Mr. Thompson Senior said to me, he says, your mother's a lady. And she says, we don't often meet ladies. And thank you for bringing your mother to our home. And it wasn't until years later that I tried to actually what they meant, that they were slightly different from the rest of us, beautifully so, and of course the stories, etc. So when Bulgari started up, Kathleen had been going down there, so I went to Bulgari Bowery and uh, Bell met us, and my father unceremoniously dumped me there on the way up to Stonehaven. So that's how I got to meet them, and lovely, lovely people, you know, and round the festivals, of course. And to do, no. Well, not being a, a singer on the stages, did you still learn the songs? Oh yeah, I learned the songs, and uh, I hummed in the background, as I like to say, and uh, I loved the stories and storytelling as well. The stories were f for me around the fires and hearing all the different stories, and I became quite a good storyteller myself. My mother would have told you that. <laughs> Very inventive stories. <laughs> and Andy, who knows me now, knows that the majority of these stories are all true and <laughs> did happen, you know. <laughs> so Blair Gowrie Festival, that was 1966? 66, yes, I was 15. And that was my first big festival, my grown-up festival. That festival changed a lot of people's lives. Completely. Uh, I think it was well as, um, I felt a very kin to the travellers because I'd had this affinity with them earlier on. And it was quite funny because I used to look at these outsiders and go, why are they learning our songs? <laughs> you know? Why are these people learning our songs? And I remember coming down to the bank question, I think, in Glasgow, and they were all sitting in gilt chairs going, appreciate. And I was just stunned at this. I went, they're not there to be appreciated, they're there to be loved and listened to, you know? It was like, I was laughing because they couldn't get some of the jokes. You know, and I was she on her laughing and they went, you know, and I went, oh no, I don't like, I didn't like the regimentality. Very quickly went, but at the start down in Glasgow, it was, um, you know, it was treated a bit like classical music, you know, uh, as an oddity, not as a way of life, you know. Uh, it did take a few years to that, get that knocked out, them, that, that that's not what the music was about. So what age did you come back to Glasgow? Uh, I think we were 13 when I came back down the road, uh, but we were still up and down for a couple of years. And seeing my granny and Eagle and then we moved out to the new town of Cumbernauld. And that's when more music came. Uh, they were just actually literally building the Cumbernauld Theatre when they were there. I can actually say I helped build the Cumbernauld mm -hmm. Theatre, actually doing pointing and walls and painting it. Uh, <laughs> not many folk can say no, that. No. You know? Uh, so again, got enjoyed the theatre out there and to uh, um, audience and to see the plays getting rehearsed and things like that and the music. So that was, um, and then we moved back into Glasgow. It was rather remote in Cumberland. <laughs> and moved back into Glasgow and I started going to the folk club in Tro Street. And that was me, sealed as a folky forever. <laughs> What was the, the name of that folk club? The Montrose Street Folk Club. Uh, Pearl and Drew Moyes ran it. And I helped sell the pies. And there was no drinks license, but you used to get really pale looking Coca-Cola, which is actually, it's the only time I've ever known guys to enjoy whiskey and coke, you know, because they could do that. Because the police would come in because it was these, these long haired beatnik people, you know, <laughs> Billy Connolly and Tam Harvey. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they wondered what these weird people were about, so. Uh, we had to have our Coca-Cola uh, with our whiskey in it, you know, when we were having a drink. <laughs> and what other folk clubs were around at the time? Well, the Attic in Paisley, and that's of course where I met Mr Kyle, uh, <coughs> and the O'Donnells, and of course they were steeped in the tradition as well, the O'Donnells, with the, uh, the other company singing. But uh, again, everybody was running around with big guitars and sort of six chords and singing American folk songs, which I was quite perturbed at at the start, but I quite liked it, you know, we had like Alex Campbell coming through and uh, Josh, Danny, Hamish, of course, 
and uh, they were bigger larger in life characters that could carry anything you know really could josh josh uh, mccree josh mccree yeah and uh messing about in the river if i say that if they always remember see joe's yeah. and of course matt mcginn it wouldn't be complete without them and all the window go glasgow characters you know and archie fisher etc and the fishers you know because of course um they went to the really young academy to Norman Buckins uh, ballad club and um, I'd occasionally sneaked up to hear it when I was down staying at my granny's you know because uh, she'd said oh there's that music you like <laughs> but odd you know the music you know but that's where I got the music and, and that was a sealed in the folk festival started up then in the 60s uh, some of course are still going likes of Keith and Newcastleton uh, Arvind Miramas as well, you know, so you had all the different kinds of festivals from what I called the Kuthi ones, uh, where the competitions etc, um, the trad competitions, right up to the, the bigger, um, sort of more commercial uh, festivals that started up in the day. Did you have a favourite festival at the time? Oh, well, I loved going up to Keith. Uh, but Glasgow was very good for music at that time. You used to have uh, one in November, the Trist, and that was very good because uh, the lads for the Cluth were involved in that. You would get, that's the first time I had heard uh, Bagag Kemper brought over and all the pipe music. And I got the un unenviable task then of trying to round them up, to get them up to St Andrews uh, out of nine pubs. <laughs> So Piper, that's when I found out the Pipers uh, like um, a wee Sherbert <laughs> in Glasgow. <laughs> I used to get the interesting jobs to do, you know. A Breton pipe band in these days coming to Scotland must return um, to something it was quite different. A, quite outlandish and it was the uh, first time I ever heard the bombards, etc. So uh, it was really phenomenal to hear, you know. Uh, uh, Actually, at the festival club one time, I managed to get 40 on the festival club stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I do remember John Fitt and Cammy saying to me, you'll not be needing sound then. <laughs> 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 but it was, it was great, it was odd. And they brought the first artists over from Bre Brittany and from Spain, uh, etc., that are Celtic cousins, and made it a really international festival, the Trice Festival. So that was a great one in Glasgow. So when when was the tries? That was me in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, and we had the Glasgow Festival as well, um, which did run for a few years. Towns were notoriously bad for running festivals in those years because uh, it was better having the villages and in the communities because you had places to go. Um, throughout the day and it was more centralised, etc. Glasgow was a bit spread out, but the venues Glasgow's got now are phenomenal. Absolutely fantastic, you know, which we didn't have in those days. Of course, the pub shut at 10, Simon. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, at what point did you get into getting behind the scenes and helping with all the organisation? Well, I think it was really through likes of Danny and Hamish, etc. when they were running events. Maybe at the McClellan Galleries used to be quite good for running events. When you say uh, Hamish, you mean Hamish Hamish, Anderson. no, no, Hamish Imlach. Hamish Imlach. Um, <clears throat> I met Hamish uh, in the 60s through the TNS8 Sandy Bells, etc. And, of course, I've met him a, f a couple of times at Boy Gowry, because he went to Boy Gowry uh, Festival. But uh, no, Hamish and Mark, etc. And I mean, the boy bands of the day, i.e., the Tannehills, who are playing this weekend, Fiddle Enough in Ireland, uh, and the Lagging, and then the, those really out, out of it folk, the JSD band, who were just quite wild lads in those days, you know. So that was the modern and Federal Commas bands coming out, started to come in at that time, and then of course the Batties, you know. And in fact, the Batties' first gig was at the Rockfield at Danny's Club in Paisley takes you back. <laughs> it does take you back, yeah. So, so, you, so you just quite enjoyed the, the organising part yeah. of it? Yeah. As, uh, the, no offence to folkies, they were notoriously bad at organising things like, you know, uh, making sure everybody knew when they were on to actually book the sound, <laughs> to take money at the door for tickets and not because it's your friends let them in and then nobody was getting paid. That uh, folkies had definitely had a, 
a different attitude to uh, commerce, shall we say, in those days. Not nowadays, but in those days, yes. So uh, I was the tartar on the door, it made sure everybody paid. Didn't care who they knew, they still had to pay to get in, you know. I think it was a two and sixpence at that time, you know. <laughs> Old money. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And so did you get involved with Celtic Connections at the start? Yeah, right at the start, uh, from day one, day festival one. Um, mainly through the TMSA because we were putting on the traditional concerts at the piping centre at that time and we were giving out leaflets etc so I used to be sitting in the hall giving out the TMSA calendars that was my first job at Celtic Connections and um, helping out Danny who would started just started doing the open stages then and um, unfortunately he passed and we'd just done the, the two, well it was one and a half, we called it, the, the second year was really getting into it. And uh, that's when Colin at the time came to myself and Gib and asked us if we would do Danny Cow Open Stage. And that, let's face it, is rather taken off, you know. And it's 20 years next year since Danny passed, you know, so it's uh, a lot of artists have come through the Open Stage. And I was also very fortunate at that time at the embryotic stage, along with Gib, uh, for getting the festival club going. And by the end up, uh, when it was the Central Hotel, I mean, you think you had it on every single night during the week. We were putting bands on at five in the morning. <laughs> Then putting them on the bus to send them home to Canada and things, you know. I remember, it was one of the most <laughs> amazing times. Yeah, I think the collaborations that came out of that time are still living to this day and still resound around the, the globe of the wonderful um, acts that had gone on and I've met up with such magnificent but also musicians. also a massive contributor to the success of the festival. Yes, yeah, definitely, you know. And I'm delighted it continues on to this day. It may only be at weekends, but I, I've heard it's mobbed. Uh, I, I get barred from it now. I'm, I'm, I'm finally getting old. I've read it somewhere. Well, I read it. <laughs> this uh, is by my family, not by Celtic Connections, I hasten to add. I read them. There was 71 acts in the Danny Kyle of the stage this year. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. And I've over 300 applied. You know, it's the most I've ever had applied this year. And from all over, I had a woman flew over from Argentina for 20 minutes in an open stage. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just go, uh, you get people applying from, as I say, every corner of the globe. I've had Australians on, I've Canadians, Americans. Uh, quite early on, I had two ladies from uh, Maine, I think, flew over with the full size harps. I mean, harps uh, to do the open stage. Uh, uh, ten piece fiddle orchestra from Norway, you name it, we've had it on that stage, and it's fabulous. And one of the best things about it is the audience. They come in every night and support every act that's on that stage, and they're just absolutely never. And of course, it wouldn't go on without Celtic Connections, because Celtic Connections have ensured through Jade and Port Portland that it's free. You know, that folk come in and can hear these wonderful acts for free. And then way back in oh, 10, 11 years ago now, um, they came to me that the emerging Celtic Music Radio was asking if they could maybe broadcast the Vanna Kyle Open Stage and uh, Mark Sheridan, who was then at Strathclyde Uni running the degree course in music then, I said, I think it would be a great asset for Celtic Music Radio. I thought, fair enough. We'll see how it goes. And, uh, just took off from there and just gave it another leg up and people who listen in from throughout the world, you know, to the Daddy Cow Open Stage, I mean, absolutely mental uh, to think how many people, there's over 100,000 listeners, but it, it's fantastic, you know, and we've got a fantastic crew at Celtic Music Radio that's built up over the years of presenters and shows uh, that has making it not just traditional music. Uh, Gordon and I are the main traditional type uh, presenters in it because we go way back, Gordon Hotchkiss and I, and we do a fantastic programme at New Year. Five years we've been doing it now, bringing in the New Year live in the air between 10 and 1 in the morning, and it is fabulous. And the amount of people that have come on from the Happy New Year, from the beach in Australia to Canada to America, 
And to people say, I've never sat up and listened to the bells for years, but we sit and listen to you two because you're mental. <laughs> what better compliment can you get than that? And the fact that it's uh, not scripted and nothing against the BBC, but it's not scripted, it's uh, warmer, it's more involving with the audience. And they Facebook us in and say things, you know, and uh, we give shout outs to people. And, uh, they feel part of a community that is it's a big family, Celtic Music Radio. And it's, it's really, uh, as I say, taken off. And, and you do your own weekly show? Yes, it's on on a Tuesday night, travels with my auntie Liz. But we've got from everything for the pure traditionalists to uh, some country. Uh, Stuart Fennick, who's a, a, a complete authority in country music, and goes to a lot of the country festivals and knows a lot of the top artists, has great folk in for his show. Mary Cathy Buck, who's a singer herself. Uh, we've got uh, our wonderful Alec Jenkins, he does in the morning but fabulously. Ross with Thank Folk It's Friday, which is a wonderful name for a show, let's face it. You know, wonderful actually, I'm missing out tons. Go to the website and find out who everybody is and when they're on and you get to listen again. And the good thing about it is that it's there for getting the music out for the artist because nobody else does it 24-7. Not unless you're an established artist that's a pop artist and they've got other criteria that must meet. So we actually get the music out there that's not getting aired. And that is the fabulous thing that we're able to do for artists, you know, and make sure that folk hear the music, you know. Well, thanks very much, Liz. What an amazing contribution. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, uh, the first 50 years have been great. I can't wait for the next 50, Simon. 